Even though the universe being created and the universe having a beginning are two logically distinct ideas, it is a fact that some atheists are discomfited by the idea of a cosmic beginning. For even though a beginning does not logically imply creation, it somehow suggests it. This has led many in the scientific world to be prejudiced. This led, I should say, many in the scientific world to be prejudiced against the Big Bang theory, and it probably discouraged research on it and delayed its acceptance, as has been admitted by more than one prominent scientist. The Big Bang theory came out of the work of the Russian mathematician Alexander Friedman and the Belgian physicist and Catholic priest Georges Lemaitre in the 1920s. In clear evidence that galaxies are flying apart as from some vast primordial explosion was announced in 1929. Yet even as late as 1959, a survey showed that most American astronomers and physicists still believed that the, uni the, uh, the universe to be of infinite age. Nevertheless, evidence in favor of the Big Bang, of the Big Bang theory, accumulated and became so strong by the 1980s that it was accepted by virtually all scientists. That the Big Bang theory is correct, however, does not necessarily settle the question of whether the universe had a beginning. There remains the possibility that the explosion that occurred 14 billion years ago was only the beginning of a certain part of the universe or a certain phase in its history, rather than the beginning of the universe as a whole. In fact, over the years, many scenarios and theories of this type have been proposed. I'll briefly discuss three of them, the bouncing universe, the cyclic, ekpyrotic universe, and eternal inflation. I mentioned that in the standard Big Bang theory, the universe has two possible uh, fates. It may expand forever, or it may reach a maximum size and collapse toward a big crunch. If it does the latter, one may imagine that instead of the universe winking out at the big crunch, as usually assumed, it bounces and begins to expand again. If this were to happen, the big crunch would be the big bang of a new cycle. One can further imagine that such cycles of expansion, contraction, bounce, and new expansion have been going on forever and will continue forever into the future. This scenario was proposed by Einstein himself in 1930. Can it be true? Almost certainly not, for several reasons. In the first place, it was shown many decades ago by the theoretical physicist Richard C. Tolman that in such a bouncing universe, the cycles grow longer and longer because of the increase of entropy. That means they were shorter and shorter the farther one looks back into the past, and in such a way that the total duration of all past cycles added together was finite. That is, even in the bouncing universe scenario, the universe had a beginning. Second, the entropy of the universe increases with each cycle, and from the amount of entropy that exists in the present cycle, one can conclude that the number of past cycles was finite. Third, it is highly doubtful that a collapsing universe would bounce rather than simply ending in a crunch. And fourth, it was discovered in 1998 that the expansion of the universe is currently speeding up. The scientists who discovered this were awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics in 19, uh, for 2011. So it is doubtful that the expansion will reverse and lead to a collapse at all. An interesting attempt to revive the idea of a cyclic universe was made about 10 years ago by Paul Steinhardt and Neil Turok. In their scenario, called the ekpyrotic universe, there are two parallel universes, each having three space dimensions, which move toward each other through a fourth space dimension. Collide, bounce, move apart, reach a maximum separation, and then move toward each other again, repeating the cycle endlessly. The idea evades several of the problems of the original bouncing universe scenario. In the first place, the three-dimensional space of each parallel universe is always expanding. And the oscillations of contraction and expansion occur only in the fourth space dimension, which we cannot experience or directly observe. This allows the scenario to be consistent with the fact that the universe 
of our three space dimensions, that the expansion of our three space dimensions is accelerating and may never reverse. Secondly, the fact that entropy always increases with time is counterbalanced by the fact that the volume of three-dimensional space is also always increasing. Thus, the entropy may always be increasing, whereas the density of entropy, the entropy per volume, can be the same in every cycle, and the cycles can all have the same duration. Clever as the ekpyrotic idea is, however, it has been subjected to strong criticism as creating more theoretical problems than it solves. And even if it turns out to be, a vi to be viable as a theory of our universe, there's a powerful theorem proved by the physicists Borda, Guth, and Vilenkin, which implies that the oscillations of such an ekpyrotic universe cannot have been going on for infinite past time. There had to be a first cycle. Another attempt to construct a realistic theory of a universe without a beginning uses the idea of eternal inflation developed by Andre Linde. The idea is that the universe as a whole is perpetually undergoing an exponential expansion. What this basically means is that there's a time scale t such that whenever a time t passes, the universe doubles in size. Such an exponential expansion is called inflation. Within this perpetually inflating universe, however, bubbles are continually forming, within which space expands in the much slower fashion that characterizes the part of the universe that we can see. That is the part of the universe within our horizon. We have a horizon since we can only see light that was emitted after the Big Bang, and such light cannot have traveled a distance greater than about 14 billion light years. In other words, we are inside one of these bubbles, and it is so vast that it extends far beyond our horizon. In this scenario, the Big Bang that happened 14 billion years ago was not the beginning of the whole universe, but merely the formation of our bubble. It should be noted that the idea of inflation was not proposed whimsically or arbitrarily because it resolves certain very difficult theoretical puzzles in cosmology. Most cosmologists, therefore, believe that our part of the universe did undergo inflation at some point in time. And it has been shown that in a wide class of theories, if some region of the universe starts to inflate, inflation tends to take over and lead to eternal inflation. However, almost all theorists agree that eternal inflation, while it may be eternal into the future, probably cannot be eternal into the past. One reason for this conclusion is the theorem of Borda, Guth, and Vilenkin referred to previously. It seems impossible that we shall ever be able to determine by direct observation whether the universe had a beginning. We cannot see what happened before the Big Bang if there was a before, because the Big Bang would have effaced any evidence of it. And, we could, <coughs> and even if we could, how could we ever tell by observation whether the past is infinite, since any particular past event that we observe must have occurred a finite time ago. Nevertheless, as we have seen, there are very strong theoretical grounds for saying that the universe most probably had a temporal beginning. This is a remarkable vindication of religious ideas. The pagan philosophers of antiquity, including Plato and Aristotle, believed that the universe had always existed, or that at least time had always existed. The idea of a beginning of the universe and of time itself entered Western thought from biblical revelation and from the profound reflection upon it of theologians such as St. Augustine. Until the 20th century, however, modern science pointed the other way. The idea of a beginning of time seemed to make no scientific sense, and there seemed to be definite evidence that matter, energy, space, and time had always existed and always would. For example, physicists discovered the law of conservation of energy, which says that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. In chemistry, it was found that the quantity of matter does not change in chemical reactions. In Newtonian physics, the time coordinate, like the space coordinates, extends from minus infinity to plus infinity. 
By the beginning of the 20th century, many scientists looked upon the idea of a beginning of the universe as a relic of outmoded religious or mythological conceptions of the world. One finds, for example, the Nobel Prize winning chemist Svante Arrhenius saying in 1911, the opinion that something can come from nothing is at variance with the present day state of science according to which matter is immutable. And the eminent physicist Walter Nernst, also a Nobel laureate, confidently declared that to deny the infinite duration of time would be to betray the very foundations of science. When science did begin to see, from Einstein's theory of general relativity, how time and space could have a beginning, and astronomical observations began to suggest that this might be, that this might be true, many atheists had a hard time accepting it. And yet, despite all the doubts and misgivings of scientists, it seems to be the case, after all, that the universe had a beginning. Faced with this fact, some atheists now pin their hopes on the idea that physics will explain the beginning. They believe that if the beginning of the universe can be shown to be natural, then the need for a supernatural cause of the universe would be avoided. We've already seen the mistake involved in such thinking. The beginning of the universe unfolding in accordance with natural laws no more renders a creator unnecessary than the opening passages of a book unfolding in accordance with the laws of grammar renders an author unnecessary. Nevertheless, scientific theories of the beginning of the universe are interesting in their own right, even if they cannot bear the weight that atheists want to place on them. 